Courtney Love, Michelle, like my middle name really is Love. Courtney Love will certainly go down in history as one of the most controversial women in rock. She's uninhibited, wild, outspoken. She exudes the freedom many women can only dream of having. However, Courtney Love can also be a huge mess, with a mouth that has caught her in trouble many times throughout her life. And sometimes she acts like an unreliable narrator. I don't like when people divide celebrities or any big names into villains and martyrs. This is especially true when it comes to personalities like Courtney's. Either she's the most insufferable woman on the planet, or she's the victim of sexist industry and media. It's never that black and white, so here is the story of Courtney Love. Courtney was born July 9, 1964, to Linda Carroll and Hank Harrison. Her parents met at a party in 1963, where Linda was impressed by Hank's charm and intellect. However, soon, according to Linda, she noticed that Hank's bragging was based on lies. He was lying about the people he knew and the jobs he used to have. Over time, Linda felt more frightened of Hank. She wasn't in love and was waiting for the right moment to break things up. Yet the perfect moment never arrived and soon Linda discovered that she was pregnant with Courtney. Initially, Linda wanted to get an abortion. She had the money and clinic address, but she didn't go through with the plan. Therefore, Linda and Hank decided to get married. The couple was very excited when Courtney finally arrived. They even stopped fighting, but it didn't last long. The fights were usually about money and Hank's lifestyle. Despite his alleged connections, he couldn't maintain friendships or find a job. Linda learned that Hank had been married before, that he had been arrested and had paranoid tendencies. She became scared of his anger, so right after Courtney turned one, Linda served Hank with divorce papers. He agreed to pay child support and was allowed to have Courtney one night a week and every other weekend. Over time, those visits, however, made Linda concerned. Courtney would come home with psychedelic magic marker drawings on her arms and legs, and she would have night terrors after the visits. Courtney herself, in various interviews, claimed that her father gave her LSD when she was little. Three people testified that he gave me acid. Now, he denies this, and, and who knows? So eventually, with the help of testimonies from Hank's ex-wife and other people who had known him, Linda managed to demand supervised visits. In her book, Her Mother's Daughter, a memoir of the mother I never knew and of my daughter, Courtney Love, Linda, who is now a therapist, recounts her chaotic life, looks back at the challenges of raising Courtney, and embarks on the search for her own biological mother since she herself was adopted at birth. According to Linda, Courtney came into this world with a very challenging temperament from the very beginning. Linda began taking her to therapists by the time she was two. At age 10, Courtney was given sedatives because she was suffering from insomnia. Courtney believed everybody hated her. It was hard for her to make friends and sometimes, as Linda explains, Courtney's mind would make up stories that never happened. A teacher once told Linda that Courtney was provocative. She would say the very things she knew would make her classmates turn against her. One psychiatrist advised Linda to put Courtney in Girl Scouts. Quote, I dutifully went to a brownies meeting with her. I could tell it was really hard for her to be in this room with all these kids. The person who was the brownies leader suggested they have an art show. She asked all the kids to draw something. The things that Courtney drew were always startling. She didn't draw sunsets and apple trees. She would draw sort of wounded figures. At the end of that, the teacher told the troop that they were going to see what drawing they liked the most by holding them one by one and everyone applauding. I knew that this would be terrible for her. When it got to hers, she just grabbed it and ran over to me, and we left." End quote. After her divorce from Hank, Linda jumped from one marriage to another. She had two other daughters with her second husband, Frank. They also adopted an interracial boy together, even though their marriage by that point started falling apart. After three years, the boy went to live with another family Linda was friends with. Courtney liked her stepdad because he genuinely seemed to care about her. Unfortunately, the second marriage didn't last and Linda married the third time. She gave birth to three more boys during the course of that marriage. But sadly, one of them died in infancy due to heart problems. To start afresh, Linda and her new husband decided to move to New Zealand. According to Linda, at that time, nine-year-old Courtney expressed her desire not to go. And that's why she was left with Linda's friend in America. Linda's plan was to first find a place to settle down, prepare things for Courtney, and eventually fly her to New Zealand. In this case, no matter the reason, any nine-year-old would feel totally abandoned. And in a sense, this feeling haunted Courtney for a good chunk of her life. The following years, Courtney would go back and forth between the US and New Zealand, staying with all sorts of people. 
First a family friend, then her stepdad Frank, then a retired educator. Nobody could handle Courtney for long, there was no place for her. Then an old family therapist recommended Linda a program in Portland, Oregon, which assessed kids with behavioral problems by focusing on chemical imbalances. As Linda writes, quote, I hated the idea of sending my 12-year-old to a treatment center far away, but at this point there wasn't any choice. We had exhausted all possible options in New Zealand and I fear that keeping her with us was the worst idea of all. If she had an illness, and many people who came in contact with her seemed to think she did, she needed care that only professionals could provide." End quote. However, Courtney kept running away from the center, and ultimately she ended up in a juvenile correction facility after being caught shoplifting. She was then placed in foster care until she became legally emancipated at age 16. Courtney kept records from that time in which she's described as a very intelligent and outspoken young lady whose boisterous behavior sometimes caused problems. Quote, Courtney's major problem area seemed to be her low self-esteem. Courtney does not feel that she is as strong as she appears to be. She puts up a very good front. While appearing to be very strong and capable externally, internally, Courtney appears to be a very frightened young lady who has never met with very much success at anything that she has tried." End quote. During this time, Courtney's family actually returned to America because they couldn't support themselves in New Zealand. And soon after that, Linda separated from her third husband. Linda writes that she visited Courtney at the juvenile facility together with Courtney's sisters. But since she couldn't handle Courtney's out-of-control behavior, Linda agreed that emancipation was the best option. After that, Linda simply coped by detaching. Quote, I had come to realize that my instability with men and difficulty setting firm boundaries had contributed to Courtney's struggles in life. Because of my guilt about what I lacked as a mother, I gave in far too easily to her demands, teaching her at a young age that with the right sort of manipulation she could always have her way. And living with me, as my other children frequently reminded me, could be chaotic. But Courtney had come into the world with a biology that created internal torment. Violent mood swings, troubles with attachment, terrible dreams, and a sense of persecution had plagued her all her life. The flip side of her creativity, generosity, and intelligence. I accepted that I had not created that temperament. But accepting that fact did not make her self-destructiveness any easier to bear. I lived in constant terror about what would happen to her. So I shut off, trying to disengage, although I could never tear her out of my heart." End quote. Courtney's relationship with her mother has always been very complicated. You can find all sorts of interviews, in some of which Courtney actually defends her mother. My fucked upness right. is not my mother's fault. It's That's your... It's your father. And in others, not so much. You have to like go, God, I come from such bad stock, you know, I must be a terrible person. That's part of the self-loathing. It's like my parents are really horrible people. Courtney was granted a small trust fund that had been left by her maternal grandparents. She was getting around $500 each month. Sometimes she would make up stories to get the most out of her fund. This money still wasn't enough, so Courtney started stripping to support herself. Back in juvie, Courtney discovered the records of Patti Smith, The Runaways, and The Pretenders. Their examples evoked a desire in her to finally become somebody. She wanted the same attention and recognition. She started going to concerts, scamming her way backstage, basically embracing a groupie lifestyle. Around 1981, Courtney attempted forming her own band with two friends. They called themselves Sugar Babylon. They weren't really serious about it, though. They would get together, drink wine, and daydream about their success. For the next two years, life would pull Courtney in all sorts of directions. She went to Japan to strip, then to Ireland to live with her dad, then to England where she stayed with rock stars and tried to revive her band. After her visa expired, she returned back to America where she worked as a DJ for some time. Then it's more stripping in Thailand and Hong Kong of all places. Finally, around 1983, after her return to the States, Courtney got a chance to front a real rock band called Faith No More. <laughs> She attended their concert in San Francisco and demanded to be their singer. It was the summer I was 18. I saw Faith No More playing with Gun Club and they had a crap singer and I had a wedding gown on and um, I demanded to be in their band. Yet, after a few months of singing with them, she was kicked out. Faith No More didn't want to have the image of a chick singer anymore. And I was unhappy as hell. After this experience, Courtney was determined to form her own all-female band. In 1984, she met Kat Bieland, best known as the founder of the band Babes in Toyland, and begged her to be her guitarist. 
According to Courtney, Kat was the best thing that happened to her. The girls recruited the bassist Jennifer Finch, who would later become the primary bass player of the band L7. And together, they became Sugar Baby Doll, an improvement on the prior name. The lineup of this group would change a couple of times together with their name because they're also known as Pagan Babies. The group actually made a demo of four songs, one of which, Best Sunday Dress, was later rewritten by Courtney for her band Hole. This song is about putting up a facade while everything else around you is burning and falling apart. But it's not a depressing song. It's almost like the narrator is embracing the bad times. They're facing the mess they've created with confidence because they know they can survive it. In late 1985, the group disbanded. Some sources say Courtney was kicked out by Kat because of internal fighting and Courtney's drug problem. Courtney started taking drugs and smoking when she was still a teenager. She couldn't practice music without getting high. And at that point, she became reliant on heroin. Courtney was still very ambitious to become big in some way, so she headed to LA to try acting. I was an actress before I was in a band. Not that I was in very good movies. She started taking jobs as a movie extra, playing punk characters. Soon she discovered that there was an audition for the role of Nancy Spongen in the Sid Vicious biopic. She felt that it was a perfect part for her. You could create one of the greatest artists of this generation, me. Sadly, Courtney didn't get it, but the director was so impressed that he offered her a smaller role. Jimmy's really impressed too. Oh. The book theme I read. On top of that, he cast Courtney in a leading role of a pregnant woman in his next film, Straight to Hell, a parody of spaghetti westerns that was shot in Spain in 1986. The press hated the movie, but loved Courtney. Courtney's acting career ultimately didn't go anywhere. She played in a few theater plays, but that was it. Kat invited Courtney to join her band, but soon she was kicked out yet again. Courtney needed money, so she returned to stripping, but this time she traveled to Alaska. The Alaska experience was really good for me, though, because I was looking at 25 and I still hadn't made it. And I went and I would just write furious write lyrics and play guitar and write lyrics and play guitar till I had like 20 songs. When she returned, she was determined to start her own band by putting an ad in a paper. After a few months, she had her lineup guitarist Eric Erlitson, bassist Jill Emery, and drummer Caroline Rue. The band's name, Hole, came from two sources. The first one is a Greek tragedy about Medea, a sorceress who gets a revenge on her husband who leaves her for another woman. Medea ends up killing not only her husband's new bride, but her own two sons. Apparently, at one point, Medea says something along the lines of, there is a hole that pierces my soul. Courtney said, quote, and she's talking about the void, the abyss that she feels, which needs to be filled, but she doesn't know what with. It's not a genital reference or anything. It's the void in all of us, end quote. And the second source is Courtney's own mother. My mother's this new age psychologist and she said, I said, you know, I had this terrible childhood. She said, well, you can't have a hole running through you all the time, Courtney. It was 1989 and that year, for the first time, Courtney met Kurt Cobain. It happened in a small nightclub in Portland where Nirvana was performing. The following years, Kurt and Courtney would cross paths many times. In 1990, Hall released their debut single, Re girl, with a cover featuring Kat Bieland hanging upside down from a tree branch. The song is just soaked with anger and hatred. Courtney explained, quote, It's about getting picked on in school, anyone who's ever been picked on in a big way or a small way. People think that song is making fun of some girl, but it's about me, about that feeling of alienation. I was so quiet. I was the quietest person and I got picked on, but I changed my ways." End quote. In 2010, Courtney also revealed that she had written the song after she was almost assaulted at work when she was a stripper. It was working at Jumbos and they tried to rape me and I'd gotten away and run out to Melrose and no one would help me. I was so angry. I wrote girl. The whole second single, Nail is even more shocking, directly dealing with such themes as rape and incest. The single's cover artwork features little Courtney lying naked in a bathtub. Courtney said, quote, The words to the song are very simple. They're like, you know, in rape, 
cases how people say she liked it or she was asking for it or look at how she was dressed. A lot of times people don't even go to jail because the woman was wearing a freaking miniskirt." End quote. In 1991, the band signed with Caroline Records to release their debut album Pretty on the Inside. Love wanted Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth to produce this record, so she wrote her a letter. Gordon agreed. The album's lyrical material is heavily drawn from Courtney's life, her teenage and young adult years that were filled with anger, abandonment and alienation. As Courtney said, on this album she decided to be the angriest girl in the world and it shows. Quote, These songs are about my own weaknesses and impurities, things about myself that I hate paranoias, petty concerns, and pithy pathetic things that are inside of me." End quote. On tracks like Teenage Whore and Garbage Man, Courtney is believed to be criticizing her parents. On the first one, it's the mother who fails to see how her actions led to her daughter's self-destructive and attention-seeking behavior. I've seen your repulsion the album's closing track, Clouds, which is a cover and Courtney's own version of Johnny Mitchell's song Both Sides Now, is also, as Courtney stated, a diss at her mother. Quote, We used to be forced to sing that in the freaking Volvo in unison. I felt so humiliated by it. It was a major diss at my mother, as much as I love Johnny Mitchell. End quote. The second track, Garbage Man, might be about Courtney's first stepdad. When Linda met Frank, he was working as a garbage man. The protagonist of the song questions the other person's absence and changed attitude towards them. Garbage Man was Hall's first song to receive a music video. It's trippy and hazy, but not much happens. You see Courtney inside the car, she's singing, drawing a heart on the back windshield, sometimes other band members appear. The visuals do create the sense of entrapment, which is enhanced by Courtney's screams, come on, let me out. Other tracks on the album, like Mrs. Jones and Loaded, seem to create delirious narratives about very disturbing characters, delving into such topics as prostitution, drug abuse, and abortion. The album's artwork juxtaposes innocent Catholic and childlike imagery with photos of women in bondage, almost naked female bodies. This aesthetic was labeled kinder whore, kind of the embodiment of Madonna mistress dichotomy, an innocent child on one side and a corrupted woman on the other. Baby doll dresses, Mary Janes, ripped tights or knee-high lace socks, a red lip and a smudged eyeliner. This was the look and it was popularized by Kat and Courtney during the 90s. In Courtney's opinion, she had to look this way for people to accept the rage that would come out of her. Quote, when women get angry, they are regarded as shrill or hysterical. One way around that, for me, is bleaching my hair and looking good. It's bad that I have to do that to get my anger accepted, but then I'm part of an evolutionary process. I'm not the fully evolved end. End quote. There were some disputes between Courtney and Kat over who invented their aesthetic, and this issue might be reflected in a couple of songs on the album, particularly Baby Doll and Good Sister, Bad Sister. Babes in Toyland were doing better than Hole at the time. Their album, Spanky Machine, came out in 1990, and they were touring Europe with Sonic Youth. Since then, both Kat and Courtney stated that the media blew it all out of proportion and there was and is no bad blood between them. Probably one of the most well-known songs on the album is Pretty on the Inside. Here's a song about beauty. A track that tackles the subjects of beauty and self-image from the sex work perspective. It can be about the industry at large and how the women are judged and picked based on their appearances and how they themselves use it to their advantage. Or it might be about men who, despite buying the services, still look down at these women with disgust. Paul's first album was generally well received by alternative critics. For a while, Courtney considered this album unlistenable and unmelodic, labeling it the weakest in terms of songwriting. It's unlistenable. That record was a calling card for rock critics and hardcores that this is what I do and I'm not going to back down from it. I am announcing my persona. I've often um, put that record down as being like beneath my songwriting capacity. 
but I, I really don't put it down anymore at all because it, it was so transformative. To support the album, Hall went on a tour around Europe and in the US, opening for the Smashing Pumpkins. During the tour, Courtney briefly dated Billy Corgan before entering into a serious relationship with Kurt Cobain. Nirvana's most successful album, Nevermind, came out a week after Hall's, so sometimes they were performing at the same places. Not long after making things official, Courtney married Kurt in Hawaii. It was actually her second marriage. The first one was annulled after three months. At the time of the Cobain's wedding, Courtney was already pregnant with their daughter, Frances. Linda would later say about her daughter's relationship with Kurt, quote, I have never seen Courtney attached to anyone the way that she attached to Kurt. They were so alike in ways that I still think about that. And what a great loss that was for her." End quote. If you look at Kurt and Courtney's childhoods, it's true that they had pretty similar backgrounds. Their mothers married men they didn't really love, which led to the breakdown of the family and divorce. Both Kurt and Courtney were the first kids in their families. They had to live with half or step-siblings. Their parents didn't know how to control their behavior, so both went to therapy and were given pills at a young age. And both ended up living with all sorts of relatives and acquaintances because nobody knew how to handle them. With Nirvana becoming the biggest band in the world, now all the eyes were on Courtney. People thought she was a bad influence on Kurt, that she made his drug addiction worse, that she was just chasing fame. Why do you think that everyone thinks you're the good one and I'm the bad one? Because I know how to use my illusion. In a 1992 interview before their marriage, Courtney stated, quote, I didn't want to marry a rock star. I wanted to be one. One, end quote. When asked if she would like to go on tour with Nirvana, she said, quote, that has to do with my band being on a level where we should go on tour with his band. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. I would rather die than go on tour with someone just because I go out with them, end quote. Kurt's success only fueled Courtney's drive and creativity to prove herself. This time, she wanted the record to be more melodic, which allegedly created some disagreements within the band, which then led to the bassist and the drummer leaving. They were eventually replaced by drummer Patty Schammel and bassist Kristen Pfaff. Courtney also managed to get a better contract for her band by signing to Nirvana's label Geffen. During Courtney's pregnancy, the band recorded a single Beautiful Son, a song Courtney wrote about Kurt Cobain and the fact that he used to cross-dress as a child. Courtney once stated, quote, This song is about boys that have problems with their mothers and are not really good, but have feminine looks. It's about androgynous men, which you have a whole goddamn nation of. End quote. On August 18th, 1992, Courtney gave birth to her daughter. And then in September, the Vanity Fair article was released, and Courtney's world turned upside down. I read it and my the earth changed. And his earth changed. The piece titled Strange Love delved into the relationship of an expecting couple, but with a weird bias against Courtney, bringing up rumors that she might be the one who hooked Kurt on heroin, or that Hall got their new record deal only because Courtney was now married to Kurt. However, the most damaging fact was that Courtney used drugs while being pregnant. The couple wasn't denying that fact, but they believed Courtney was misquoted. Courtney did use the substance in the first three weeks or so, but as soon as she found out she was pregnant, she stopped. The article, in couple's opinion, made it seem like Courtney was still heavily using. The writer quoted various unnamed insiders who feared for the baby's health. The photo which was chosen for the article was also controversial. Courtney was smoking during the shoot. You can see her fingers curled like she was holding a cigarette. The photo was airbrushed, but somehow the word got out and everybody wanted to get the original. Courtney and Kurt ended up buying all pictures. Courtney called it blackmail. But the worst was yet to come. As soon as Francis was born, children's services got involved. The couple temporarily lost custody of their daughter. They weren't allowed to be with her without supervision. During the investigation, Francis was living with Courtney's sister. When the couple was finally allowed to take Francis home, they still had to submit frequent urine tests and expect visits from a social worker. The woman in Vanity Fair came into our house with an agenda. She knew exactly what kind of uh, articles she was going to write. She knew that she hated Courtney because of the rumors she'd heard, and she believed them and decided to write a crucifixion piece. It's as simple as that. Courtney and Kurt got paranoid. They didn't know who to trust. According to Courtney, though, Kurt was affected way more. To clear their name, the couple did some fluff pieces, as Kurt called it. 
quote, We've had to do fluff pieces to try and fight this thing. It's embarrassing to have to do that, to pose with your family on the cover of a magazine, to hope that some people at least question the validity of Vanity Fair, end quote. Yet, Vanity Fair was not the only publication writing about the couple's addiction, and those articles were not entirely without foundation. Kurt was in constant cycle of detoxing and using during Courtney's pregnancy. The fight for their baby made both of them clean, but after that was done, they practically went back to their old habits. However, Kurt was sinking way deeper than Courtney. He was suffering from stomach problems and depression and the self-imposed pressure and stress of being famous. Courtney once revealed, quote, I lived with someone who said everything every day that he was going to end his own life. And it wasn't like I was bored with it by any means. I did what I could to make sure that didn't happen, and that resulted in a lot of hysteria on my part. There was a lot of screaming, a lot of yelling, a lot of kicking the walls, a lot of broken fax machines and telephones. I started to feel like my purpose in life was noble, to take care of these two human beings, my husband and child, and make sure that they lived. And it was a fine purpose. I didn't have a problem with that." End quote. Kurt tried ending his own life several times during his marriage to Courtney, and in April 1994, after escaping from a rehab facility, he sadly succeeded in his attempt. Courtney herself was in an LA rehab center when she got the news. Some believed Courtney was somehow involved in her husband's death and that it was murder. Her own father published a book about it and a private investigator whom Courtney hired to locate Kurt when he escaped also turned against her. That really was ouchy. That really was horrifying. And then I just got used to it. In 1994 Rolling Stone interview, Courtney disclosed that Kurt left her a personal note. Quote, he wrote me a letter other than his side note. It's kind of long. I put it in a safe deposit box. I might show it to Francis, maybe. It's very after up writing. You know, I love you. I love Francis. I'm so sorry. Please don't follow me. It's long because he repeats himself. End quote. Courtney's grieving was public. Media surrounded her and Kurt's house in Seattle. She felt it was important to address Nirvana's fans, so she recorded herself reading Kurt's last note, which was found next to him. The recording was played at Kurt's memorial. Courtney was also seen talking and comforting some of the fans. She was even giving some of Kurt's belongings away. Something good can come out of Kurt's death. I don't know what it is yet, but something good can. A week after Kurt's death, Hole's most influential record came out. The album was titled Live Through This. It obviously wasn't about surviving her husband's death, but more about surviving the media backlash. Nonetheless, some lyrics definitely acquired new meaning. This great record comes out and then all this awful I'm not stuff. I'm psyched what my lyrics are. Yeah. When naming the album, it's believed that Courtney took inspiration from the movie Gone with the Wind. I'm going to live through this and when it's all over, I'll never be hungry again. The cover art features a photo of a model who is posing as a newly crowned pageant queen clutching a bouquet. Courtney wanted to reenact this scene from Carrie. I won! I have hemorrhoid cream under my eyes and adhesive tape on my butt and I had to scratch and claw, but I won Miss Congeniality. And that, that's the essence of sickness in this culture that I'd like to capture. For the back cover, Courtney provided her own photo when she was little. Material-wise, Live Through This touches on Courtney's favorite themes of beauty and self-image, violence against women, heartbreak and betrayal, but also pregnancy and motherhood. You find a lot of milk imagery in the lyrics, which in some cases can be a substitute for a variety of things, including drugs. On this album, Courtney continues to contrast adult themes with girly imagery, and it's evident when you look at the covers of four main singles. Miss World was the first single which was issued ahead of the album. The music video continues the theme of Carrie at prom. Courtney plays a Miss World who is being crowned. You can see her going through an excited crowd towards the stage. She's receiving flowers and applause along the way. These scenes are periodically interjected with the whole band performing on stage, with an old proverb behind them that reads, cleanliness is next to godliness, which I think is a sarcastic comeback at press and media and what they've been writing about her, her dirty look, her sick apartment, her addiction, because the song also starts in a sarcastic tone. In the beginning, you have a narrator who is trying to come to terms with fame and attention they're getting. wanted this life, but now people have started assuming things about them, spreading rumors, being envious. Some are just waiting for this person's downfall. Yeah, 
By the end of the song, however, the person realizes that this is the price they're paying for getting what they always wanted. Their actions got them to this place and they have to embrace both good and bad parts of it. The second single, Dull Parts, initially was supposed to be a song about an aching heartbreak. Quote, it was about a boy whose band had just left town, who I'd been sleeping with, who I heard was sleeping with two other girls. It was my way of saying, you are a freaking idiot if you don't choose me. And here's all the desire and fury and love that I feel for you. Good songs don't always come in 20 minutes, but the force was strong and that one did. Anyway, I married that guy. End quote. After Kurt Cobain's death, however, it was hard not to interpret all this pain as grieving, especially if you watch the music video. The MV was directed by Samuel Bayer, who also did Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. Bayer has said that he wanted the video to evoke the feeling of death. Some parts of the video are black and white and others are in color. Everything in the video looks decaying. You see Courtney playing guitar on a bare mattress in an almost empty, dirty room. A little blonde boy shows up, playing with a disfigured doll. At the end of the video, the little boy leaves the room and Courtney closes the door. It was a well-known fact that Kurt Cobain loved vintage dolls. He often made them by himself. In the song, Courtney compares herself to a doll, implying how empty and dead inside she feels. In the MV, you also see her outdoors attending a bleak tea party with the same creepy dolls. She ends up destroying the whole setup. Courtney commented, quote, One of the most provocative images in the video for Doll Parts is the young, blonde, Kurt-like boy, because it was my right to reference it, and I wanted to reference it. It happened. My husband was taken away. It was tasteful. I had this gorgeous little boy with me. We had a real fun time with him, end quote. Someday you will act like I ate. The third single, Violet, to me, is an anthem to self-destruction, as the singer invites others to basically rip them to shreds. Before performing this track on stage, Courtney would sometimes say, quote, This is a song about getting the freaking shit bit out of you and loving it, end quote. This can be taken literally, of course, but when I listen to Violet, I think of a person who is so drained and tired of the bad things being thrown at them that they don't care anymore if they live or die because they have nothing else to lose. I'm the one with no soul. During the climax of the music video, Courtney stage dives and the crowd starts tearing her into pieces. She used to do it a lot while performing and especially on tour after her husband's death. In the book, Courtney Love, The Real Story, the author writes that Courtney dived from the stage almost every night, and watching her do this was like watching a woman do a painful penance. You, in a way, have a death wish. Dying I think that's what the before. stage diving was about. Yeah. Was like, all right, kill me, crucify me. Get me. There's a lot of powerful imagery in the Violet's music video. It features scenes of Courtney as a stripper, the time when people look at you as a piece of meat they want to devour. It portrays stripping, you know, stripping has always been in, in, in video, like used as an enhancement. It right. portrays stripping as the very depressing thing that it is. And I know, because I did it for many, many years. There's a contrast between clean girl versus dirty girl, ballerinas versus strippers, and Courtney plays both. She used to attend ballet classes when she was younger, and after Kurt's death, she became obsessed with this sort of imagery, and even had a photo shoot dressed in a vintage ballet costume. Quote, This was pretty soon after the death of my husband. I became obsessed with angels and ballerinas, things of grace and beauty, otherworldly. I kept crying about every 15 minutes, so I was a makeup nightmare. I wanted to be the swan in Swan Lake and flutter, crumple, and disappear. End quote. Sometimes Courtney would also say that Violet was a song about Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins. A song about a jerk. I hexed him. Now he's losing his hair. The fourth single, Softer Softest, paints a protagonist with a hard, maybe even abusive childhood. The song's original title was Pea Girl. While introducing it, Courtney said, quote, It's about the girl that always smelled like pee in your class. She was me. End quote. Tracks like Plump and I Think That I Would Die, Courtney directly addresses motherhood and the custody battle she had to go through. Asking for It and Jennifer's Body are two songs that touch on assault and violence against women. Asking for It was inspired by a crowd surfing incident in which Courtney was left almost entirely naked. 
Quote, Someone took a picture of me right when this was happening, and I had this big smile on my face, like I was pretending it wasn't happening. So later I wrote a song called Asking For It, based on the whole experience. I can't compare it to rape because it's not the same, but in a way it was. I was raped by an audience, figuratively, literally, and yet, was I asking for it? End quote. Jennifer's body is, as Courtney called it, her captured girl song. It tells the story of a woman who gets kidnapped and dismembered. It's believed that the movie Jennifer's Body was named after this song. The movie's soundtrack features whole song Violet as well, since Diablo Cody is a huge fan of the band. However, Courtney was very disappointed that the director never mentioned Hole or credited her as an inspiration. Similar to the previous album, Live Through This has a couple of songs about Courtney's beef with other people. She Walks All Over Me might be about Cat Bialant again. Courtney once said, quote, you know when you're in high school and there's that one girl and she tries to copy you and you're already a big freak anyway and nobody likes you, but then she tries to copy you and get popular over it. That's what this song is about. End quote. <laughs> On the final track, Rockstar, which was supposed to be called Olympia, after a town where Riot Girls initially originated, Courtney sarcastically criticizes the movement, and specifically, Kathleen Hanna from Bikini Kill. Courtney never wanted her band to be lumped with this movement. She complained that Riot Girls were too, quote, teensy wincy widow cutie. I think the reason the media is so excited about it because it's saying females are inept, females are naive, females are innocent, clumsy, bratty, but I wore those small dresses too, and sometimes I regret it, end quote. Leave Through This was met with critical acclaim, going platinum for 1 million copies sold. However, this success was overshadowed by rumors that Kurt Cobain was heavily involved in the making and writing of the album. People around Courtney and Courtney herself obviously denied it many times. A lot of people saying that Kurt had written songs on there, and if he had, I'd have been proud to say it, but he just didn't. And then another tragic thing happened. Right before Hall was scheduled to embark on an international tour to support the album, their bassist, Kristen Pfaff, passed away due to an overdose. The tour was postponed for a couple of months. And then, Melissa of der Mauer was invited to join Hall. The tour itself was chaotic due to Courtney's erratic behavior on stage. After playing the first show at the 1994 Reading Festival, Courtney felt like people were expecting something from her. Quote, the vibe to me was like goddess worship on the verge of stoning me to death. What did they want? A freaking cover of Tin Spirit? I don't understand it. Were people curious as a freak thing? I think they wanted me to cry, and I won't. End quote. Some people thought it was too early for Courtney to go back to work, and that it was suspicious that somebody would return to work so soon after the death of their spouse. In people's eyes, Courtney was too emotional and not emotional enough at the same time. It was no secret that Courtney was abusing substances to deal with her pain. She even had an accidental overdose of prescription drugs. Later, while looking back at that period, Courtney agreed that she shouldn't have been allowed to go on tour or have interviews like the one she did with Barbara Walters. Uh, someone should have locked me in my room. Yeah, yeah. not let you near Barbara yeah. Walters. So, yeah, yeah, and like not stuck me on Barbara Walters. Although, I must say that our band gave some amazing shows at that time, but right. they were in, they were insane. During the year 1995, Courtney found herself in a lot of controversies. First, she was arrested after getting into an argument with an Australian stewardess on the plane. Apparently, Courtney put her feet up against the cabin wall and refused to put them down. Courtney, These are my really flat. offensive feet. Okay. <laughs> then, at the Lollapalooza festival, Courtney allegedly punched Kathleen Hanna in the face. She was sentenced to anger management classes. From Courtney's recollection, Kathleen Hanna insulted her daughter, and that's how the altercation happened. 
Later that year, Courtney was sued yet again by two male teenagers who said that Courtney punched them during a concert. However, the case was dismissed. Yeah. They couldn't get to Kurt's money for Kurt's nothing. Secret. So you think that's what they wanted? That is what they wanted. During 1995 MTV Awards, Courtney also infamously crushed Madonna's interview. Courtney Love is in, in dire need of attention right now. It seemed like everyone was just waiting for Courtney Love to hit the rock bottom, but she never did. In 1995, Vanity Fair actually decided to do a cover story on Courtney, a clear apology for the 1992 piece. It's a compassionate article and Courtney is presented as a sorrowful angel in the photos. After Hall's world tour concluded in 1996, Courtney had her biggest break in acting, landing a role of a lifetime in a critically acclaimed movie The People vs. Larry Flint. Courtney earned a Golden Globe nomination for her performance as Larry Flint's wife, Althea. Courtney loved The People vs. Larry Flint. Working on the film forced Courtney to go through rehabilitation and stay away from drugs. I lost like 30 pounds and quit doing heroin. The style was transformed as well. No more doll dresses, smeared black eyeliner or red lipstick. Now it's all about flowy, ethereal, figure-hugging tops, gowns, glitter and gloss. Womanhood is a spectrum. We as females have thousands and thousands of years of fashion in our DNA. We want to wear nice close. It's part of what we do. Courtney also got into a serious relationship with her co-star Edward Norton. You're in love with him? Oh, I adore him. I love really? him. Really? Yeah, mm. I do. And what? No kidding. He's very good for me. Courtney's experiences in Hollywood and LA wound up heavily influencing Hole's next album, Celebrity Skin, which was released in 1998. This was a melodically pop-leaning record on which Courtney wanted to evolve as a songwriter. For a while, Courtney was in a big slump struggling to put this album together, and that's when Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins offered her his help. Initially, Courtney was hesitant. Some were still convinced that she didn't write Live Through This. Now, if she allowed another famous guy to come in, the history would would repeat itself. And it did. After the album's release, this was one of the things Courtney kept being asked about. I'm not nasty about it. I think he did a really great favor for me personally and he helped. But remember, there's 12 songs. He's publishing on five. It looked like Corgan wanted more credit for his work and that created an argument between him and Courtney, but eventually everything was resolved. Unfortunately, this wasn't the only controversy surrounding the album's production. The producer that was hired to record Celebrity Skin decided that Hall's drummer, Patty Shamel, was too weak, so she was replaced by a session drummer. Courtney didn't really stand up for her drummer at the time, looking at the whole situation as part of business. Later, she expressed her regret over the decision. I did do this horrible thing to Patty where I ruined her life for two years because I kicked her out of the band for the duration of the record. After leaving Hall, Patty cut off contact with her family and friends, heavily got into drugs, and became homeless for over a year. You can still see her on the back and white front cover of Celebrity Skin. All four members are standing in front of burning palm trees. This was Patty's last photo shoot. On the back cover of the album, you can see the painting of Drowning Ophelia, a Hamlet's character who has become a well-recognized representation of femininity and madness. Compared to the previous album where Courtney toyed with milk imagery, here it's all about candy, sugar and sweetness, as well as water and drowning. So something that is sparkly and perfect on the outside, but ugly and dead on the inside, which on some songs refers to the Hollywood machine and celebrity culture. Celebrity is concept art, and the, what is real art is music and film. The first single, which has the same name as the album Celebrity Skin, is exactly about that. This song opens the album and it's basically a welcome to the celebrity world where some people will make it and others will be crushed by pressures. In the music video, which is very sparkly and vibrant, you see women dancing in bright purple dresses. They're dangling from the ceiling, which makes them look like marionettes. They're not smiling, they look completely down and empty inside. In this world, nobody cares what's going on behind the scenes and who is going to be sacrificed as long as the final product looks perfect. Another track that explores predatory nature of celebrity culture and music industry in particular is the track Awful. Despite the song's upbeat and happy sound, the lyrics paint a pretty sad picture of young female consumers being exploited by their own idols. There might also be some commentary on the direction of the music in general, how now everything is about what sells the best and what doesn't. 
I don't know if the music video was ironically intentional, but it just features a montage of Hole's clips from various live shows during their tour. Before performing the song live, Courtney would sometimes state that it was about Gavin Rosdale from the band Bush, with whom she allegedly had an affair. Specifically the lines, He's drunk, he tastes like candy, so beautiful. That's all. That's the moment. In the 90s, the band Bush was receiving a lot of hate for their immediate commercial success. They were called Nirvana wannabes, and many believed that Gavin's looks played a big part in the band's popularity, attracting more female than male fans. One more track, which also seemed to comment on the greedy music industry, is Playing Your Song. Courtney called it the only cynical song on the record. We can play rock better than any boy on the planet! Some speculated that it was Courtney's direct attack on the other members of Nirvana, especially Dave Grohl and his move to Foo Fighters after Kurt Cobain's death, plus their feud over Nirvana's royalties. After her husband's death, many expected Courtney Love to write a big widow's record. But in her words, she would rather be cryptic than literal. Quote, I had a choice. Do I write about this or do I write around it? And I chose to write around it because to do otherwise would have been, well, undignified, not right, dishonorable, exploitative, cheesy. End quote. Some songs on celebrity skin have parts about saving somebody and following them to the heights of heaven or the depth of hell. The best examples would be Use Once and Destroy and Malibu. The first track is a tale of someone who tries to rescue another person but in the end finds only pain and darkness. Some also think that this song describes someone who is dealing with drug addiction, especially the physical part of it. <laughs> Malibu, on the other hand, is more hopeful. It presents a more romanticized version of escaping a hard situation together and running into the sunset. Courtney explained, quote, the song's about leaving in a trailer in Malibu with my first boyfriend, Jeff. I was 16. And it's kind of about Kurt, too. It's an empathy song. Come to me, I'll save you. I wanted the boy in the song to drive away from Hollywood and the drugs. When I was pregnant, Kurt and I always had this thing about getting out of the basement apartment we lived in with dealers next door and going to live in Malibu. It's a very healing place. End quote. The music video is so beautifully freeing, and Courtney and Melissa look very gorgeous in their dresses. The video continues the theme of a burning Malibu that you see on the album's cover. The band is performing near the beach while everything around them catches on fire. There are scenes of Courtney sitting in the trailer, Eric waxing a surfboard, and Melissa lying on a rock over the ocean like a mermaid. The final scene shows a group of female lifeguards holding baby dolls on the beach as Courtney heads towards the ocean to take a dip in it. There are three more songs on the album with the same escapist slash bittersweet energy. They are Hit So Hard, Boys on the Radio, and Heaven Tonight. You can't listen to Hit So Hard and not think of He Hit Me and It Felt Like a Kiss by The Crystals, which Hole covered several times. While the original song tells the story of a domestic abuse victim, Courtney, on the other hand, while still toying with the same imagery, sings about a great orgasm. According to Courtney, Boys on the Radio is about self-destructive pop boys. Quote, it became about a girl who sits alone in her room and listens to the radio. The boys on the radio sing to her and promise her that, you know, when she gets to heaven, they'll be there. She thinks all the songs are about her. End quote. Heaven Tonight has a more sinister story behind it. Apparently, Courtney once said that it was about a teen girl who is driving down the Pacific Coast Highway to lose her virginity to her boyfriend. She ends up getting into a car crash and dying. <laughs> One of my favorite songs on the album is Reasons to be Beautiful. To me, the song is a poetic way of saying, help me find a will to live. Courtney always felt like America wanted her dead, and that's basically how she starts the song. According to Hall, they wanted to name the album Reasons to be Beautiful, but Courtney felt like it was too beauty magazine, so they didn't. 
the most depressing songs on Celebrity Skin are Dying and Northern Star, which make you want to rip your heart out. Dying, here the name speaks for itself, is about pleading and longing for somebody to rescue you, maybe even from yourself. I'm dying, I'm dying, and Northern Star, as Courtney herself put it, is about Edward Norton trying to save her from her dead husband's ghost. And I cry, yeah, you know, why? met Edward Norton, who was a real Herculean savior and came to my rescue and I came to his rescue. His mother was dying and I was dying. The album's closing track, Paddles, makes for a feat and end as it echoes the theme in the first song, Celebrity Skin. It paints a story of an innocent and pure girl who is slowly getting corrupted and crushed by the world she's in. Celebrity Skin was Ho's most commercially successful album. It was nominated for Best Rock Album at the 1999 Grammy Awards. To support the album, Hall went on tour with Marilyn Manson. The experiment turned out to be a disaster. First of all, the majority of concert goers were Manson's fans, who were less interested in the Hall's performances. And second of all, the 50-50 split of costs between the two artists, which resulted in Hall financing most of Manson's production costs. After nine shows, Hall made a decision to drop out of the tour, but the band continued to book shows on their own. Soon, Melissa left the band to pursue solo projects. She went on to be become a touring bassist for the Smashing Pumpkins. The drama also quit a few months later. Then the Hall's label, Gaffin, got acquired by Universal and sued Courtney and Eric for failing to deliver five promised albums. Courtney countersued and alleged that the label failed to properly promote Celebrity Skin. She also had another lawsuit pending against the former Nirvana members over the control of Nirvana's catalog. The tension and fighting between Courtney and Eric resulted in them announcing the end of the band in 2002. Hall's Hall's final release was a single Be A Man for the movie Any Given Sunday. The lyrics sarcastically explore the social pressures and privileges of being a man. The music video features Courtney with blue hair and in a blue matching dress walking on the football field among the players. When it starts to rain, she rolls in the dirt, gets naked and makes out with one of the players. Funnily enough, in 2013, Courtney revealed that this was one of the dumbest songs she ever wrote. I personally like it and the video looks sick. After disbanding Hall, Courtney's drug addiction returned in full force, and she began getting into trouble again. In 2003, she was arrested at Heathrow Airport for disrupting a flight. The crew said she had become uncooperative and verbally abusive when asked to return to her seat and put her seatbelt on. Same year, Courtney got arrested again after breaking several windows of her producer and then boyfriend's house in an attempt to enter the residence. Just hours after being released on bail, Courtney was hospitalized for an over dose, which occurred in front of her then 11-year-old daughter. Courtney ended up temporarily losing custody of Francis. How hard was that for you? And it's yucky. It's, it's just, I guess it's my turn. Despite the drug issues, Courtney was still preparing to release her debut solo album. She traveled to France to record it. I just wanted to be at a chateau for six months and do drugs. So. America's Sweetheart was released in 2004, and it was a commercial failure. Courtney called it one of her life's great shames. I cannot exist as a solo, a solo artist. It's, it's, a ridic it's a joke. No, I don't did you see the, did you see the, the faux Playboy cover? Come on. <laughs> you know what? You can tell a person by their failures. I've learned to accept it. I think Hold On To Me is a really good song. I think um, All The Drugs is a good song, so Whoops. whatever. The album is not that bad and some fans might even call it underrated. I personally love maybe half of the songs. It's true that Courtney's voice is hoarse and rough and sometimes it can be too much. The lyrics are pretty direct and can come off as tacky in places. It just feels like Courtney is trying too hard to be punk. There's just something that doesn't feel authentic compared to her previous work. There's no overall theme on the album. Courtney comments on the state of rock music promises that she will never be silenced sings about sex because why not and once again tries to save somebody from drowning Ho 
Hold On To Me and Sunset Strip are the two tracks that remind me so much of Celebrity Skin's material. Courtney sings about fame and Hollywood and how empty she still feels after achieving so much. I wish the vocals were a bit better, but these are still good songs that are tinged with sadness. The album's main single, Mono, was accompanied by a music video which explores Courtney's public image. Courtney appears as a sleeping beauty. As soon as she is awakened by fairies, the paparazzi start chasing her. Once in the modern world, Courtney begins wreaking havoc, destroying everything she sees, which results in her being pursued not only by the press, but security and police. During the chase, six little but armed girls in puffy dresses help Courtney escape and return to her safe glass coffin. 2004 was the hardest year for Courtney Love. And my most hardcore drug abuse came in 04. And that was because of financial crazy. She was convinced her and her daughter's money was being embezzled and it was driving her crazy. Some people believed her, some thought this was attributed to her mismanagement of her husband's estate and her drug issues. Eventually, Courtney found herself on the brink of bankruptcy. I was broke for four years. Being broke is horrible, as everybody who's broke, and most people are, know. Being broke and really famous, no one believes you're broke. In 2004, Courtney's behavior was still causing a media ruckus. To promote the album, Courtney was invited to appear on David Letterman's show, during which she hopped on the host's desk and flashed him. She wanted to imitate what her friend Drew Barrymore notoriously did during her appearance in 1995. Drew Barrymore had done it when she was 19 and I was so out of my mind, I thought that I was 19 and I was actually 39. The same night, Courtney got arrested for throwing a microphone stand at a fan during the concert. And soon, she was charged with assault yet again for physically attacking a woman at the home of her ex-boyfriend. And then, Courtney had her 40th birthday from hell. She was taken from her New York apartment to a psychiatric hospital, where she was placed on a 62-hour watch. But I was just sitting in my apartment, someone called and said that I was on Lenny Kravitz's roof and I was going to jump. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going anywhere. After undergoing rehab, Courtney managed to regain full custody of her daughter, having lost it in 2003 after an overdose. However, in 2005, Courtney had a public relapse. We haven't seen you in a while. What's been up to? Um, you know, not doing drugs. She appeared intoxicated on a show about Pamela Anderson. I weigh 180 pounds. I'm using. Somebody should have said, walk. Get the off that stage now. Go. Courtney also tried ending her own life, but she survived the overdose. Now Courtney was facing prison for violating her probation. I think that you need to hit rock bottom before you make a decision. In the end, she was sentenced to mandatory rehab. From that point on, according to Courtney, she stayed sober, but was still on some prescription medication. In 2006, she published a memoir, Dirty Blonde, and began working on her second solo album, How Dirty Girls Get Clean, which ultimately turned into Nobody's Daughter, a record that was released under Hall's name in 2010. However, the lineup didn't consist of original members. Melissa was invited to sing some baking vocals on the album, but she wasn't involved in live performances. She felt disappointed and surprised that Courtney decided not to have a real whole reunion. Eric also voiced his disapproval, stating that he and Courtney had a contract that prevented her from reforming Hole. In 2002, when I was all f***ed up, I signed a document allowing Eric to have 50% of the name, which was a greedy, empathetic move on his part. He shouldn't have done that, but now we've worked it out. So he gets his money and it's whatever. As usual, the disagreements were resolved and now, as stated by Courtney, all members are pretty good friends. Nobody's Daughter was almost Courtney's return to her roots. I always forget that Skinny Little Bitch is on this album and not on the first two. Many were interested to know who this furious song was about, but according to Courtney, it's about nobody in particular. Quote, it just felt zeitgeist. It just felt right. There are so many skinny little bitches doing so many bad things. It was like, remember when Paris Hilton used to say, that's hot? It was just the right phrase for the right time. End quote. As far as I know, Courtney never stated this, but the name of the record weirdly feels like a reply to her mother's memoir called Her Mother's Daughter, which came out in 2005. Courtney obviously hated that Linda wrote a book about her, even though it was more about Linda's life than Courtney's. I am 
not anybody's daughter. My mother was nobody's daughter. She was adopted. My grandmother was put in the Hollywood orphanage. And obviously, Frances is two very big somebody's daughters, and she's trying to be nobody's daughter. So it's a strange matrilineage that I have. Courtney's own relationship with her daughter has been rocky as well. Around 2009, Courtney lost legal guardianship of Frances, who preferred to live with her grandmother. Moreover, Frances filed a temporary restraining order against Courtney. Nowadays, they seem to be in a better place, but who knows. The album's artwork focuses on historical female figures who get executed. For example, on the front cover, you see a portrait of Marie Antoinette cropped at the neck, and on the back cover, there is a similar portrait, but of Anne Boleyn. Courtney said, quote, The art is pretty self-evident. We always seem to get rid of the good dames, end quote. In terms of the themes, Courtney sings about her downfall due to addiction. Some songs were written when she was in rehab. <laughs> Loser Dust, which is such a fun and energetic song, is directly about Courtney's cocaine use. On Never Go Hungry, Courtney opens up about her financial rock bottom. Quote, it's about my daughter, and it's about how we were. We were just so broke. It was sort of like that moment in Gone with the Wind when Scarlett O'Hara eats the dirt. It really was. So I vowed that we would just not ever go hungry again. End quote. I will never go hungry. I go hungry. Another hopeful track on which Courtney uses the same figure of speech is For Once in Your Life. There are of course tracks about Courtney's romantic relationships with men, for instance, Someone Else is Bad. So you're lying in your underwear. Quote, some of it is about a guy, not someone the public know. He's very public, but I'm just insanely discreet. But it's about a guy who is a freaking mess, frankly. And apparently, I'm really attracted to guys that are a big freaking mess. I guess I think I can save them." End quote. Sunday morning when the rain begins to fall. Courtney also revealed that one of the songs, particularly Honey, is straight up about her dead husband. Well, I good enough to save you from? Many also believed that Pacific Coast Highway was about Kurt Cobain. He was the only boy who ever knew the truth about me. The most emotionally intense song on this record might be Letter to God, on which the narrator is praying for some guidance and salvation. Dear God, I'm writing this letter to you. This track wasn't written by Courtney, but by the producer Linda Perry. However, Courtney's aching voice and delivery are unmatched. I'm coming up to you. Please help me. me. Another beautifully haunting song, which I love, is Happy Ending Story. It was a Japanese bonus track on which the singer begs somebody to tell them that everything will be okay. They need some words of encouragement to keep going. Is there a happy story? Is there? Is there? Out of all promised promotional music videos, only one got released for the track Samantha. The video takes place in a bombed city where Courtney is completely alone. While wearing a wedding dress, she escapes from jail and then walks around the burning city. The song is supposed to be about Courtney's destructive alter ego. There were also two videos for Skinny Little Bitch that were posted on the band's YouTube channel. One was of the band performing at a show, and another, shorter one, was of Courtney singing the song while getting a tattoo. Nobody's Daughter was considered to be another commercial flop, however, Skinny Little Bitch was a hit. The reviews were mixed, with critics saying that the record was quite banal and generic, but at least it was better than America's Sweetheart. I personally love it from start to finish. Yes, it's nothing new, and Courtney's vocals are not the same, but the song is still good. After this record, Courtney dabbed into fashion and art, debuting an art collection titled And She's Not Even Pretty. In 2014, Courtney released two new songs, You Know My Name, which was about Courtney's fame and notoriety. <laughs> Wedding Day, which was about the experience of getting dumped. A music 
video was released for the first song, but with the theme of the second. Courtney said, quote, I'm supposed to look like an old Victorian doll crossed with a Dickensian character called Miss Havisham, who got abandoned on her wedding day at the altar and lived to be a hundred, end quote. In 2015, Courtney released an EP called Miss Narcissist. While the B-side is nothing special, the main single is the twin sister of Samantha in terms of the theme. <laughs> 2014 to 2017, Courtney appeared in several TV shows and movies. She also never stayed out of trouble, getting involved in several lawsuits. Now Twitter was her battlefield. I, I didn't really know what Twitter was, so um, I got in all sorts of trouble. In 2020, Courtney received the Icon Award at the NME Awards, an annual music awards show in the United Kingdom. While being on stage, she revealed that she'd been sober for 18 months. But I also have 18 months sober today. I thought that was like... Yeah. So her recovery from addiction is still ongoing. Since 2014, Courtney has been teasing a real whole reunion, but nothing has come into fruition. In 2021, she said it was definitely not happening. Currently, she seems to be working on her solo album, plus she's finally done writing her memoir. Love her or hate her, Courtney Love is a very fascinating woman who has been through hell and back. She's a real survivor, or like Courtney once put it, I'm like a cockroach, the ones that survived the nuclear blast. Carrie Fisher, who was once very close to Courtney, explained the life of a survivor brilliantly in Courtney's book Dirty Blonde. Quote, Unfortunately, the only thing wrong with being a survivor is you have to keep getting in trouble to show off your gift. Getting in trouble and then getting out again, bearing gifts. End quote. No, mommy doesn't want this conversation. 